early on in your career, you might not know the capabilities of yourself and kind of the extent to where you could take your career. When you're going into this unknown world, this dojo, because it's so scary, I think it has to be something that you really want to do. It hurts. Learning hurts. What's cool about today's age is not all dojos are in person. You could have a virtual dojo. I used to get upset when people would ask me that because I'd be like, do you think I need help? <laughs> Who says tech can't be human? What is going on, everyone? Welcome back to the show. Glad to be back again. We are talking about dojos today. Mm. We talk about dojos all the time. I mean, I think it comes from back in the day, martial arts flicks, right? You have the seemingly weak protagonist and they go somewhere and they train and then become a mighty warrior. I feel like one of the best examples of me going into a dojo was honestly the Hacker House. When I was moving from the East Coast to the West Coast, starting at Netflix, right? I was living with you, Napoleon, Marco, and all we did is we focused on a few things. We focused on cybersecurity, technology, personal growth and development. So we were bringing in yoga instructors on Wednesdays, on Sundays, you were leading us through like breathing techniques. And honestly, that was one of the big inspirations for the podcast. We're like, yeah. this experience is one of the best experiences I've ever had in my life. How do we share this with the world? And so we started talking about this stuff online. When you think back, to those days, like, is there anything that comes up for you? The podcast. Yeah. I mean, that, that's how the podcast started. It started with us having these two unflattering angles of each of us. Because yep. we didn't know what we were doing at the time. We didn't have the no setup clue. that we have today. And you could even go back and watch those episodes if you want to have a good <laughs> smile. Those episodes are still good. But that's what really stands out to me is the, the building the podcast. But you have always been in this, like, personal growth and development. You've always been going into dojos. What was that first big technical dojo that you went into when you started getting into technology and cybersecurity? I would have to say the first big technical dojo is Black Hat and DEF CON. Mm. Going to Black Hat and DEF CON is almost like going to the Mecca if you are in cybersecurity because there's a lot of people that are leaders. There's a lot of people that are hungry, trying to come up in the ranks of cybersecurity, learning more, showing off their technology. But there's also a lot of people that are just regular people. And I think when you look at that being such a melting pot, it makes it such an amazing place. It's like Disney World. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is like Disney World uh, because there's so much that you can learn. You can go to the different villages. You can go to the Social Engineers Village. You can go to Lockpick Village. You could do the IoT Villages. I have so many villages these days. But when you're going into a new dojo, it could be a little daunting. It could be a mm -hmm. little uncomfortable because you're going into a place where you don't know the language really. You don't understand the people. You don't want to like upset the apple cart. What keeps people from going into certain dojos from your perspective? Is it fear? Is it uh, a lack of understanding of their own personal skills? What keeps people from going into the dojo to get better? I'll keep it in the context of Black Hat and DEF CON. There's a lot of restrictions that someone pay, may put on themselves and maybe even the world puts on people. Mm -hmm. Traveling to Vegas is always going to be expensive because there's hotel, there's flight, there's food. Food is very expensive in Vegas. But there's also this feeling of entering into a new environment. My first time going into Black Hat and DEF CON, I remember feeling like I wasn't skilled enough. Like I didn't right. have those reps. I didn't have a black belt. And I was going to go to a school with all black belts. Mm -hmm. Little did I know there was a lot of people in the same situation that I was in. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I put a mental block on myself to a certain degree. Luckily, I still went through with it. And there's also this aspect of connecting with others. Yep. Connecting with people that you don't know. You're connecting with people that have a level of understanding in a domain that you're supposed to have an understanding on, which might make you feel a little timid or unmotivated to speak to people. And my first DEF CON, I remember I was always following my friend Marco around, the one that mm -hmm. we lived with. I was like, hey, Marco, like, I'm just going to follow you. Like, if mm -hmm. you go to a party, I'm going to a party. If you go to a talk, I'm going to a talk. Because I didn't feel confident enough to 
go out into the deep end and talk to strangers at that point? Yeah, I think when you're going into this unknown world, this dojo, because it's so scary, I think it has to be something that you really want to do mm -hmm. or something that you're really curious about. Once you got into the, the bigger dojo of cybersecurity, what was that smaller dojo where you said, I want to spend a majority of my time. I want to talk to the people that are doing it really well. I want to study this thing at night in my off time. Like, What was that first big dojo in a cybersecurity context? The first small one was work. Uh, I used to work at McAfee and our team was really small. We had like 10 people on our team. And up until that point, I never really knew my my coworkers. Maybe we would have happy hour every now and again, but I didn't know them from like a cybersecurity career perspective. Like, where do you want to see your career go? Mm -hmm. And we built our team around that. We wanted to make sure that we only hired people that were moving in a similar career trajectory as us. And mm -hmm. that was powerful because not only are you working with these skilled people, but you're also working with people that are going to help you get to that next level. They're not going to hold you back. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you feel as though you're ready to leave your job, they start to give you a counter offer. They start mm -hmm. to ask you not to leave and to reconsider. I think that's really selfish. Mm -hmm. And that could put anxiety on a person for taking that next step that's going to put them into a better place. When I first felt comfortable at a bigger dojo, it was at ShmooCon. There were people from my local community. I'm from Maryland. So you have people from the DMV, DC, Maryland, Virginia at that conference. So I felt like I was now able to not only connect with people, but to make meaningful connections I could follow up on. We're in the same time zone. You know, we're in the same locale. I could even meet up with you to learn more about you as a person, but mm -hmm. even from you as like a technologist perspective. Yeah, what's cool about today's age is not all dojos are in person. You could have a virtual dojo. You mm -hmm. could have a little meetup that you and a, a couple friends get together and you work on a, a problem together. Maybe you do CTFs, maybe you're doing bug bounty, maybe there's all these different little dojos. But sometimes you might think you want to go in a certain dojo. Maybe it's like a Cobra Kai and they're like, <laughs> Ugh, I don't, I'm not trying to go in that dojo. I mean, right. It's time for me to find a new dojo. How do you find that right dojo for you? And then when do you make a decision whether to stay in a dojo or not. You have to really assess what kind of community do you have there? Because on one hand, I would say you should know all of what you want to do beforehand. You should have some goals. They should be clear to you. But early on in your career, you might not know the capabilities of yourself and kind of the extent to where you could take your career. So mm -hmm. I think your community helps shape that. And having people that lift you up is a great thing. Now, sometimes on LinkedIn, I see and other social media platforms, I see building such a positive environment to where there's no, you know, negative talk. But I think being in a dojo, you get your butt beat big time. You have to you have to be challenged. Sometimes your chin gets challenged. And I think that type of environment is great when there's at least some sort of competitiveness, mm -hmm. someone that's going to help push you to get better, not support you and hold your hand each step of the way. That's great when you have a little bit of a balance of both of those things, someone that can hold your hand, but also someone that is a little bit more in your face saying, mm -hmm. hey, I think you can go out to the limb and, you know, reach out and get the fruit of your labor. One thing that I'm curious about is once you enter into a certain dojo, let's say it's a community, and you spend a, an appreciable amount of time, you start to move up the ranks, right? Just like a belt system. I remember when I went from a white belt to a blue belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, that was a big deal for me. That was a lot of time, preparation, sweat, blood, tears to get to that level. Mm -hmm. What do you think about what it means to level up in a community? How do you start to give back? How do you start to perform at your best? When I first got started in my career, I was the one asking people questions. And the only question that people would ask me is, how can I help you? Mm. I used to get upset when people would ask me that because I'd be like, you think I need help? <laughs> <laughs> and and <laughs> in a lot of cases, if yeah. you are like that white belt, you do need help. Mm -hmm. you, you're not as experienced as everybody else. But I think one of the ways that you realize that you're leveling up in your community is people start asking you for real advice. Right. Sometimes the student becomes the teacher. Mm -hmm. And it's very evident when that happens because you start to get access to people in a different way. You know, maybe you have access to have a great conversation, a nice chat with someone, but it's a whole different ballgame when someone asks you if they should take 
a new job, mm -hmm. if they should go buy a book and learn this new subject that they don't know much about. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's one great way to really assess where you're at in your community, but also to give back. When someone asks you that question, when you see that opportunity to help, step up and, and take it. We have some news to share with you, a member of the Hacker Valley Media family. As of 2023, we became a full-time independent cybersecurity media company, and we're committed to bringing you the most powerful, thought-provoking stories in the field of cybersecurity. And we learned we can't do it alone. We'd love to invite you to our exclusive Patreon community, where we host a monthly mastermind where you can meet like-minded individuals in the field of cybersecurity that are trying to be more creative and be the best version of themselves that they can be. We would love if you took a second and visited patreon.com forward slash Hacker Valley Studio, and we'll see you in the mastermind. Let's say you've been in this particular org. Maybe it's a conference that you've gone to for several years. Maybe it's an organization like a Discord, and you are at that black belt level. But you've been there for five, six, seven years, and you're like, you know what? It might be time for me to find another dojo. What would you say are some of the best tenants for someone to leave? Because I've been in situations where I've spent a lot of time in one dojo and I leave, but they feel slighted that I left right. because I wanted to move on to do something else. Maybe it's a, a hobby like dance. Maybe it's Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Maybe it's being a part of a conference that you help cultivate, build, but you want to move on to other things. How would you do that in the best possible way? Don't do it. Don't, don't do, it. do it. That's at least my advice right. to myself. I don't give up easily, even if I lose interest, because there's so much that I can learn in any case. I was listening to the Founders podcast, one of our favorites, mm -hmm. and the host was describing Henry Ford. And there was this part where it's like, if you're an expert, you realize that you actually have so much to learn. The experts are the ones that don't want to be called experts right. because they have so much to learn. So if somebody was asking me what they should do to gracefully leave, I would say gracefully stay. One of the things that I found really difficult when I was, this, is, this was probably during the time we were uh, at, in Cali. I remember I wanted to go to the American Kickboxing Academy. I hadn't trained in years. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing I did was I put my daughter in. And I put my daughter in. I see her training. <laughs> you go and, first. I, and my hands, my hands are sweating because I'm like, oh, man, you know, if I'm going to step back on these mats, they're going to know I'm out of shape, mm -hmm. out of practice, but I'm sitting here wearing a blue belt. And I was like, it's going to take some vulnerability to go back into the dojo. What would you say for the folks that have been, you know, pretty senior in their career? They haven't been in a dojo in a long time, but they know the technology moves so fast. And they, they almost have this, this ego that's preventing them from going back into the dojo. What would you recommend to somebody like that? How would you inspire them to have a little bit of vulnerability Go back into the dojo and start learning again. Get in there. That's all I would say is go do it. Go yeah. get it. It hurts. Learning hurts. And when you are afraid to go back into the gym, the dojo, whatever the case may be, in, in our case, sometimes it's getting back into the technical side of cybersecurity, that stuff hurts because you're not as sharp as you used to be. And in some situations and in some cases, it makes you feel as though you're back at the beginning. It's mm. that same point of tension and conflict. Yep. But I think that's also part of the the grind. That's part of loving the process is getting your butt beat, feeling a little bit drained. Because if you're doing something and you're not feeling that at least some level of resistance, it might be too easy and it might be time to find something new. One last question. What dojo are you going to next and why? I'm going into the dojo of film. It's scary. It's frustrating. We actually have a book right over here about documentary filmmaking. And this world is completely foreign to me. It's alien. Mm -hmm. When I'm reading the books, I feel like I'm a part of a conversation and I'm a little kid and I, you know, a little yeah. kid trying to listen to adults speaking. Yeah, exactly. And there's a lot of greats that have publicly done film before me. Mm -hmm. In cybersecurity, I thought it was very safe to jump in because it's a new field. There weren't a lot of experts right. 10, 12 years ago. But in film, there's been experts for 100 years now. Yeah, big time. Um, and I'm excited to get in there because mm -hmm. one of the advantages that I have as a newbie in the game is inexperience. Mm -hmm. uh, Socrates has uh, a piece of wisdom that he says, 
the man who knows the least is the wisest. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to try to use that as my to my advantage and not have the same hardships, the same um, delusions that you, someone may have had being in the field for 10, 20 years. I love it. Get in the dojo, find the dojo for you, stay in that dojo, and when it's time, leave and find another dojo. Got to find a dojo. We actually have our own dojo. Mm -hmm. It's a Discord community. You can find it by visiting hackervalley.com forward slash Discord. We would love to see you there. And with that, we'll see everybody next time.